lockdown was since was March last year. Between March and June last year was the worst of the lockdown. I personally experienced an immediate um, panic from parents who were not getting paid um, their maintenance that could not perform in terms of settlement agreements, maybe um, spousal maintenance even, or um, sometimes there was a division of assets where the one person would pay to the other person a monthly down payment. So the bulk of the problem or the bulk of the effect of the lockdown was mainly, mainly experienced between March last year and June. That is how my firm um, experienced the influx of complaints. Now with the adjusted level three, I noticed that it is not as, or the influx of complaints, you know, um, my ex lost his job and he can't pay me in terms of the settlement agreement or he can't pay me in terms of the maintenance agreement. It is not as severe and as, as hectic as last year. So I, I, I don't, I, I, didn't, I didn't find that there's a, um, an extreme influx now. So it seems to me like people have actually adjusted since the extreme lockdown last year, March, where people have made provision um, for um, the con contingencies and the um, unplannables, as I like to call it. So I don't see any difference since, since, um, since about September last year. Yeah, I don't know about other firms, but my major influx was between last year, March and June. Yeah, so if I, if I try to lead him into the line, there might be so as well. People do not know how long this pandemic will continue. And they had a bit of a dry run, as um, we had now. Um, last year, March, with that initial hard yes. lockdown. And people are now starting to figure out, you know, let's do what we done last year. Yes. We do not know what's happening with schools as well, because um, the sc they're talking about the schools, the schools are supposed, supposed to open next week, uh, now, or this week, and it's now opening yes. on the middle of next month. So obviously, these are s a serious issues. And, and as we, we the reality of the matter is, in my view, is that there are still problems within the maintenance court systems whereby if a minor child is now longer with one parent than anticipated, clearly there's a financial burden on the family and the household. What is your view regarding that? Yes. Well, you know what? Yes, sorry, you can continue. Yeah. Nazi what I do is I just usually um, I mute myself when someone else speaks. Nazi, we want to hear your voice. People are tired of hearing my voice. Tell me, what is your experience regarding that? Look for me, for, in, in my practice, I, I've, I've noticed that the issues that people had before COVID and the issues that people have now is no different except that it feels harder now because the children are longer at home. You know, kids eat all day. Kids, kids uh, uh, um, need things when they are at home, you know. So this, this has caused that whatever maintenance amount you pay right now is not sufficient anymore because you would pay for breakfast and dinner and then the child's lunch at school, which will maybe be an apple, two slices of bread and, you know, a water. But now the kids are all day long at home and kids eat all the time. So now that maintenance amount that would have covered breakfast and the child's school lunch and the child's dinner is no longer sufficient because this child literally eats 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. It just it goes on. So many parents that now complain to me, you know what, Nazli, I need an increase. I can't maintain this child on the current maintenance amount. The other party might not understand this because, you know, for the whole year, this has been fine. Or for the whole 2019, this has been fine. For the whole 2020, this has been fine. In fact, I've given you a CPI increase as per the agreement. So what is the problem now? You want an increase on top of that. But they don't realize that the expenses tied to this child cannot possibly be the same as when that child is all day at school and only comes home at 2.30. You know, you know what I'm saying? There's more electricity usage. The kids are playing games online. They are, uh, um, they are using um, amenities. They are using electricity. They are using the internet all day long. They are using more water because at school, they're gonna tell the child, listen, um, you can only go twice to the bathroom in the morning. That's water used twice. 
drinking water, flushing the toilet. But now at home, the mother or the father doesn't say, listen, you can only go to the toilet twice. It means if that child flushes that toilet 20 times a day because he can go to the toilet, he is going to. So it's all kinds of household common joint expenses that is being increased, and that is apart from the food. And what about the increased internet? Because these kids are now being schooled online, so it means that where two gigabytes of data would have sufficed, now the kids, these kids have to download programs, they have to download notes, they have to download the old textbooks, they have to be on Zoom all day long. So it means that that bowl for the internet will triple or, 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 or quadruple or whatever you want to call it, you know? So parents, I think, must be understanding that we live in a funny time. We live in strange times. COVID has put a lot of financial strain on all of us. So I am not surprised that a mother would come to me right now and say, listen, I got an increase last year, February, but it's not sufficient. I cannot maintain this child on that increase. I need a bigger contribution because of the bigger expense of these kids being at home. So I think parents must really, they must help each other out. These are, are, are trying times, it's terrible times. They need to understand each other. To throw a lawyer into the mix so that to, to make you understand that these kids eat more at home, that they use uh, um, joint household expenses or common household expenses, it's not necessary. I tell many people, you don't need a lawyer to explain to you that a child eats food. You do not need a lawyer to explain to you that a kid that is at home and is learning online is going to need data or is going to need more data. Why do you need to pay me 3,000 rand so I can let a magistrate tell you that this child is using 700 rand of data per month if you know for a fact the child is learning from home? So my advice to people out there is recalculate everything, recalculate the situation where the child is literally all day at home. Forget school. Obviously, you pay your school fees. You need to continue to pay your school fees because the teachers are still teaching your kids. They're still sending notes. They're still preparing papers and homework and all of that. So I'm not saying don't pay the, the, the school. What I'm saying is recalculate the child's new expenses for home. There is going to be more internet. There is going to be more water, electricity. There is going to be more telephone because these kids call the teachers. These kids uh, uh, call each other because they're lonely. They have to, to um, deal with this new uh, distance, social distancing thing. I find that my own daughter is uh, starting to become anxious because when is she going to see a friend? So I find her sitting for an hour just talking to a friend on the telephone. And then after that, I see that she's calm, less anxious. People must just be understanding we have a new order and it's COVID-19. Now, everyone, you heard um, Nazali Williams. Now, I'm in court a lot and I um, litigate a lot. And the way Nazi spoke for the last five minutes was, as I'm certain she speaks much better if she's before the magistrate or before the judge. Nazali, that was a nice um, um, few minutes which I enjoyed myself because it's very, it's very rare when I see passionate attorneys arguing the case and arguing the points. And you've done a very good job regarding that. I'm not a judge, Nazali, so you did act like a, like a, like one of, are you bringing argument to me? But I'm certain that the listeners and the viewers all understood this. Um, we, I'm speaking to Nazli Williams, an attorney in practicing Cape Town. Her details are on the screen as well. So if you need to get in touch with her, please do that. You can clearly see she knows the family law very well, and she's really passionate about that. Nazli, for this, before, I have a question for you, but I want, to answer this, I want you to answer this question for me. You are a mother, am I right? Um, how many children do you have? Sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, you, you are a mother. Yes, 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 that's right. And and how many how many kids have you got? I've got three children, two toddlers and a soon to be teenager. So you you understand that the issues involved and, and how it is to, to hear a minor child and, and what it entails. No wonderful. I, I just don't want to bring that to them. Because it's important that when, when you have a lawyer dealing with the matters, the attorney should, you know, be empathetic and understand the issues involved. So we, we just appreciate. So Nazli, divorces. Let's move on to divorces now. I have seen a bit of a change in the amount of people that are getting separated, the problems that they experience, so they want to get divorced. Have you seen any change on your side since COVID-19? Yes, I have definitely. 
um, what I've, if I can compare it to the pre-COVID uh, um, situation, before COVID, if someone had to approach me for a divorce, there seemed to have been really no, um, unless, of course, I'm, I'm speaking excluding abuse. I'm talking now about we've drifted apart. As I'm talking about the, the normal, we've got nothing in common, we've drifted apart, we, are, we just want to separate. I'm not talking about abuse allegations. Before COVID, there was no rush. People, I would get my instruction and we would try to, to sort it out and there's maybe a little bit of litigation and then at some point these parties settle. Now that it's COVID, because of this new um, challenges that people have, money, of course, and then also illness in the family, someone that the one party's mother is maybe suffering from COVID, the other party's father is suffering from COVID. I've seen a new urgency in people to get this done. I've seen, I've seen a, 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 a tremendous influx of people coming to me who has already been diagnosed with depression, severe depression. Whereas before COVID, a person would say, you know what, 10 months ago, I was diagnosed with, with, with depression, but I, haven't, I, I didn't need to use my medication uh, uh, because I'm, I'm fine now and I'm dealing with it. But now with COVID, it appears like the people who have been diagnosed in the past and who have been, you know, managing uh, the depression and managing managing the, um, the the issues, whatever it might be, they cannot deal now. So most of my new people are already back on their medication because of the challenges that COVID bring, which is mainly financial, and then also. Before, where people were keen to, to, if you ask them, listen, have you tried to, 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 um, to reflect and maybe go for, for marriage counseling, which is obviously a duty of mine to make sure that these pe people have gone for counseling or tried at least. Um, people are now just saying, no, I, I am stuck with this person in an, in a, in an household. We, um, I can't go anywhere because this person and this person has covered around me. I cannot deal with this in this house. So COVID has forced people now to stay in close vicinity of each other with the financial uh, stress that's coming with it, with the fact that family members are dying and, and uh, suffering from COVID-19. And people just don't have time, money, or energy to be going for for, for um for reflection or for therapy or for marriage counseling. They want it over and done with. So different is, is that I saw people have a urgency that was, that I've never seen before, COVID, never. So, that, so that's the main difference that I've noticed. Sorry, Nancy, my, my other issue which I have picked up over here is that people now want to get divorced quickly and they want a quicker unopposed divorce um, packages. Now, um, there, there are many going around, but I would like to give you the opportunity to speak about your one. What, what, what's, so, what, what's good about your unopposed divorce package? So they contact you, they email you, and you can tell them more about it. But in a nutshell, um, if I may, for example, I don't, I don't think any divorce matter should be opposed in the sense of the parties must fight. Um, the only people or person that benefits there from are the lawyers and maybe the courts because they got work to do. Um, however, what is it to fight over the property? Parties are made other coming to property. There's nothing to fight over the property. They made income into the property. Um, the joint estate must be divided. Simple. Um, one parent will obviously care for the child, but the other one maintenance must be de be decided based upon the parties' incomes and means. So, so there might be um, a reason to mediate it, or maybe have lawyers writing letters up and down. But there's no need to litigate it and go to court and spend thousands of millions on litigation. Now, the unopposed divorce packages you offer. What what have you seen? Are the benefits they all? Well, with my, I have the, the, the IE divorce platform where you can um, apply for your divorce directly online. I think what is different with my, with my uh, platform is that once I receive this, this form with your application form, I make sure that this settlement agreement does not only work for you right now to get it over and done with. I make sure that that settlement agreement keeps on settling for you many years to come, many days and many months and many years after you have signed that settlement agreement. 
What is very disconcerting for me and what is very worrying to me is that I get people who come to me who has already been, who, who is divorced already, and I and they want a variation application to be done. Okay, so I look at the settlement agreements that is drafted, and many a time the parties want to settle this as soon as possible so that they can go on. But then the terms in the settlement agreement has been approached with the same attitude, meaning the term is there. You are going to pay me out this uh, this amount of money, and that is that is my share of the joint estate. But what people fail to discuss then, because they don't want to get out of it as soon as possible at the cheapest rate quick as possible, is that there's no term saying by when. There's no term saying what happens if the person doesn't pay it or what is the alternative or can the parties agree something else. So you, so in my case is I make sure that if there's a term in that settlement agreement, I make sure that it can be met by both parties. That it's not just something that is said, you need to pay me by this or you need to pay me this amount. So I'm, I take time and I actually take pride in looking at my settlement agreements individually, making sure that it suits and fits fit the, the, um, the specific parties that I'm dealing with. So if two parties have a house that needs to be divided, they will not have the same terms just because both have a, a house to divide. There will always be something extra with the one that requires something extra. Like for example, if the one uh, uh, cannot get a bond, uh, uh, um, qualify for a bond substitution, I will make sure that I put in there, if you do not qualify for a bond substitution, then you, we must place this property on the open market and you guys will agree to, to the terms of the deed of sale and you will agree to the, to, uh, um, or um, cooperate with marketing the property and you will be liable half half for the transfer fees. Many people don't put in the transfer fees. Who's going to be responsible for the transfer fees? So, because these, they think these are small things, but these are the things that keep people connected negatively to each other once the divorce is finalized. You don't want that. What is the purpose of getting divorced if you keep fighting after the divorce because the settlement agreement wasn't clear? So I think what makes me maybe different is that I obsess over how that term can be twisted around to cause the party's trouble afterwards. As far as possible, and as far as I can, I try to cover all angles for both parties, so there will never be a need to take this agreement to court asking, what did you mean when you said you're going to pay me by the 1st of August? Did you mean 2021? Did you mean 2022? And who's going to pay the transfer fees? You said I'm a transfer house. Who's paying the, the veto certificate and the electric certificate? All of these things. So I think that is what sets me apart. I kind of obsess about these smaller details. I do not want parties to have comebacks. I do not want parties to fight once the divorce has been granted because there's a reason why we need to stop and cut the ties, negative, negative ties, obviously, not the positive ties. There's a reason why we need to, to do it properly. Yeah. yeah. Nazri, interesting you mentioned that because last time somebody consulted with me, with me, the consent paper um, stipulated that the wife can stay in the house um, with, with, her, with her husband so they can still remain in the home and he will continue paying the bond and pay her alimony. Yeah. But no mention was made who pays for the rates, who pays for the water and so on. And that was the basis upon which is coming to my office because of those specific problems. So, so now Steve, if I exactly. look at your product which you are offering over here, you are customizing it to the needs of the specific client. And who wants a client, you know, they pay you your, your, your fee today, but in the future they must spend double that amount of money to fix the problems that you can fix in the first place. Yes, yes, yes. That, that is what we don't want because I, I believe, I don't know, um, maybe, I don't know if it's strange or if it's, if it's different from, from other legal practitioners. But I do not like comebacks, even if it means money to me, because to me it means I made a mistake or I, I gave you a solution that ended up not being a solution. I, you know what I mean? I want you to go and live your happy life, spend your money on your children, spend your money on, on, on building your new life post-divorce. To me, that can, I think the, 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 for me, the value of, of having a person say that attorney 
did my divorce, my uncontested divorce, and I never had an issue with the interpretation of my settlement agreement. I never had an issue with anything regarding my, it was all clear. We both knew what to do going forward. Our kids' arrangements in respect of our minor children was, was so clear that we never fight about pickup times. We never fight about who's gonna pay the doctor's bills. That word of mouth for me is worth much more than charging you for fixing something that either someone, another attorney did, or even that I did. That's the value of word of mouth and knowing that I've helped the family to live happily post-divorce or as happy as you can post-divorce. That for me has more, more value than charging you a couple of thousand to, to, to fix the agreement. So, so that is just how I think. I don't know how it's for, for other legal professionals. And that's, that's important that the person has that specific mindset. Because if you do not have a specific mindset, you know, you're you, you practice, you running your legal practice on, on a very really, you know, unsustainable manner. You, know, you, you want to cook your clients, uh, which I don't think is a good idea. But I heard some comments somebody once told me that the difference between a good lawyer and a bad lawyer. A good lawyer is one that wins the case. Sorry, a bad lawyer is one that wins the case. A good lawyer is one that takes forever with the case. Your contract has got nothing to do with love. It doesn't mean that you don't love or trust the person that you're going to marry. It is a union based on love. But at the end of the day, there is still a partnership between you and this person that has patrimonial consequences and that has economic consequences. So a marriage to me has all these different components of which love is the most important, of course, but we cannot, we cannot fail or neglect to admit that there's other aspects of a marriage that we need to take cognizance of, okay? If you go and buy a house or if you enter into any credit agreement with a, a third party, if you did not have, if there was no economic or financial or patrimonial consequences to your marriage, then that credit provider would not be asking you, are you married? Are you married out of community of property or in community of property? They would not be asking you these things if it was of no consequence. The creditor, the third party, has got nothing to do with the love relationship between you and your partner. So when you enter into an antinatural contract, you are not only affording yourself economic freedom to deal and deal as you please, meaning obviously you need to make good financial um, decisions and choices, but to, to, to have freedom of contract, meaning you can contract as you please because you've got your own estate, but it also protects your partner against your creditors. So for me, actually, this is a, an act of love because you are protecting your partner against your creditors and vice versa. So if you are planning on getting married or you are going to get married, it is very important to discuss with your partner entering into an antinatural contract. There are two uh, uh, um, matrimonial property regimes that you and your partner can choose from, okay? Which one you choose is going to depend on factors like, you know, have you been married before and already built up a significant estate? Have you, um, are you both starting from the bottom uh, um, with nothing? Uh, are you business people? You know, maybe both of you are big, big business people with significant debt and assets. It's going to depend on that. You need to go and see um, a lawyer, obviously. To, to, to find out which one is, is, is best for the two of you. But the main thing you need to keep in mind is that if, you are not, if you're not going to enter into an ANC, an antinatural contract, you are literally responsible for half of your partner's debt, whether it was incurred before the marriage or whether it was incurred during the marriage, okay? All your assets 
are going to form part of the joint estate. So even if you bought a 10 million rand home before you met your partner even, that house is going to belong to both of you and it's going to be 50-50. So if anything happens at termination of the marriage, and please do not just think of divorce as termination of marriage, death also terminates marriage. And if death terminates your marriage, this is going to become the, the headache of your spouse having to deal with your executor uh, uh, um, freezing accounts because you have a joint estate and the, the um, estate needs to be, the deceased estate needs to be wrapped up first because this account must be frozen until then. You're going to give your spouse significant stress, especially if there's no will even, having to deal with your executor because of this joint estate that is now half frozen or even fully frozen. Okay? So, do each other a favor and at least go and speak to an attorney about the benefits of an antinatural contract. And in my opinion, the benefit far outweighs, I, I don't know of any cons, I don't know of any um, not good reasons why we should not be entering into an antinatural contract. We protect each other against each other's creditors, preserve your economic freedom, and um, yeah, that is, that is basically it. But go and see your attorney and find out which matrimonial property system is best for you. But it cannot, I, I cannot advise anyone to ever get married in community of property. I, I cannot. I don't know if any other attorney has a good reason that can maybe just let me know. Maybe the advocate over here can tell me if there's any good reasons why someone can or should. I don't know. But personally, go and see an attorney so you can at least find out the why and the how and the which which one no i think an extremely good reason to marry to get married in community property is if you marry someone who's extremely extremely old and you're extremely young and he's if you or she's extremely you're wealthy. breaking up and um, um sorry about that i think the connection was bad so now if you marry someone who's extremely wealthy then it makes sense to get married in community property it seems to me you can't hear me yeah, it's a bit um, difficult to hear you. It's breaking up. I've okay, let's what... try again. Yeah, I think a good reason to get married in community property is if you marry somebody extremely wealthy. You got that. But 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 you but what usually people who are really wealthy has got significant debt sometimes. So what if something happens? And then you you get stuck with all the debt, or all those debtors need to be, or creditors need to be paid from the wealth, and then there's this huge uh, uh, um, shortfall, and then I become responsible for a million billionaire debt. Uh, yeah, I, I still don't think I still, I don't still don't think it's a good idea. Maybe in the antinatural contract, you can maybe um, negotiate with your partners on certain um, assets being transferred to you upon the, uh, termination. I think that would be the safer bet, where you would say, listen, you are extremely wealthy and I am not wealthy. Uh, uh, um, or maybe even a cruel, maybe even a cruel, you know, where you, you can have some sort of 50% uh, of the accrual paid out to you. But to maintain that separate estates, I think, especially protecting each other against each other's creditors, I think nothing can, can replace that, that safety over there. The accrual can be brought in to maybe take care of you uh, um, should the marriage terminate. And then also, e even if you marry completely out of community of, pro of property with no accrual, nothing prevents you from negotiating with your spouse that upon termination, there is going to be certain assets transferred to you. You know, you know what I mean? But in community property, you are connecting the person to the other person's not only wealth, you're connecting them to the debtor. You are taking away trading in your economic freedom, meaning your contractual freedom. You can't just go and buy a car or a house because you need the consent of the other person. And take that control away from a person. I, I still don't think there's any good reason to get in, uh, 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 married in community property. Accrual, yes. I would say do that, then you can share in the accrual, or I will say completely out of a, a community of property and then just negotiate with your partner at 
at the time when the um, ANC is being negotiated, that certain assets or money or whatever the case might be gets transferred to US fund termination. But I don't think there can be any monetary value placed on your economic freedom and on separating yourself from someone's debt. Uh, I don't think so. No, Nazi, I'm, I'm with you regarding that. My I, additional comment earlier was somebody extremely wealthy or extremely old as well. So that might pass away mm. soon. So that might help if you're married in poverty. But Nazi, I'm not joking here. I don't even heard that. My, I see the sound of a bit of a challenge. Um, Nazi, thank you for that passionate um, information. You, you're extremely uh, passionate about the law about giving your clients value for the money and so on. I think there's a bit of echo on that side, but, but I'll continue chatting. Um, I think, okay. I think um, it's important for people to know that there are lawyers out there, attorneys out there, that are not out there only for the money. I mean, they must charge a reasonable fee for anybody. But it's nice for me to now and again meet passionate lawyers like yourself that is out there to assist people and do not, I mean, as, as you mentioned now, regarding uh, anti nuptial contracts, I'm certain that if somebody comes to you to draft an anti nuptial contract, you will make sure they understand it, the pros and the cons they are, as opposed to, you know, selling a thousand anti nuptial contracts for the year and you make, for example, a million rand on that. You'd prefer to, to sell 50 anti nuptial contracts for the year, make less money, and get quality to the specific people. Thank you for that. Nazri, we have another few minutes. Um, I would like to ask you one or two questions. Um, I did say maximum an hour. Nazri, how, how do you deal with clients who are emotionally stressed out? They come to your office, they're crying, they are emotionally weak. How do you deal with those type of clients? Um, you know, because I, I myself, I, I like you, you just mentioned, I am I'm very passionate and um, I, I, I really love people and I always take it so upon myself to sort out a problem. But what I've learned in my few years of practicing, I'm not going to claim it's a lot, but um, I've seen enough, is that a lawyer should never climb into a client's case with their emotions. I find that when you do that, you are actually costing your client more because your client come into you with these feelings and these emotions. And what I do personally is I manage my response to my client and the opposing attorney, meaning the attorney that is representing the other party. I let my client know that um, I cannot I cannot, obviously I am I'm very I'm sympathetic and empathetic and I'm, I'm very good with that. I, I, I can, through us in Afrikaans, I can comfort my clients, obviously in a professional manner, but I make sure that my client understands that my job is to make sure your rights stay intact and to make sure that we enforce your rights and that make sure that you are legally covered. The emotional part, there is another kind of professional who specializes specifically in the emotional parts of these things. Because if I am going to put on that jacket where I need to deal with your emotional uh, uh, pain and I need to make sure that you are covered legally, I'm going to drop the ball on something. Because there's going to be endless letters between myself and the opposing counsel because I am also reacting out of emotion now because I've climbed into my client's emotions. If my client cries me crying and say, listen, I've been locked out, okay? It's terrible. I get angry because how dare another person treat another person that way. But I cannot go on my laptop and write a, a three-page letter to the other attorney Telling the other attorney how terrible his client is and how cruel his client is and how we are going to do this and this and this. I cannot do that because my client has to pay for those two or three letters. So what I tell my client is, you know what, we're going to sort this out. It is terrible. I'm so sorry that you're going through this, but we're going to sort this out. And for me to write two or three sentences to the other lawyer and say, listen, my client has been locked out. Please make sure my client has access by five o'clock this afternoon, failing which I'm going to approach the court on an urgent basis and I'm going to apply 
for an interdict, and I, the cost is the legal cost is going to be for your client's account. End of story. I charge my client for one email, and the other lawyer knows exactly what I want, and we are waiting for it by five. I'm not going to send 10 more letters to say, listen, you didn't respond yesterday, and, my, um, and we said by five, and you didn't, you didn't give access by five, because now it's another 10 letters to tell that lawyer about the, the, the cutoff of that, um, that letter. So it means I was, I, it mean I was climbing into my client's emotions. I am hammering on costing my client's money, but there's no solution. There's no court order. There's nothing that my client can use that can give her access to this property that he or she has been locked out. So many of my clients might think that I might uh, um, think that I am maybe like um, too short. Like in, you know, I was supposed to say that the other person is, is um, an animal for acting this way. It doesn't further your matter. It doesn't, it, in fact, it costs you more. It costs you to bicker for me, to bicker to another attorney, but I can't come to you and say, here's your court order. We're going to enforce this court order. If it doesn't comply, we're going to call the police because we've got a court order, or we're going to go back to court and we're going to have him arrested. All I'm going to say is, you know what? I didn't get a response from the other lawyer. But at the end of the month, you're going to have to pay me a thousand rand for those 10 letters that got no solution for you. So when you ask me, how do I deal with the emotional clients? Obviously, I love my clients. I give them all the support that they need. But you need to remember why you appointed me. You appointed me to get you court orders, to get you solutions. And you don't want to pay me 100,000 rand just to write 20 letters to remind someone else of a duty or to remind someone else of a right that you have. You need to pay your lawyer for a solution. That is what you need to pay your. So always remember that. You do not want your lawyer to be your fellow or your comfort. That's not what, what, what we do. You need your lawyer to enforce your rights. That, uh, I don't know if it comes across um, cold, but I, I, I hate when I send a bill to a client and all that is in that bill is, co uh, is correspondence correspondence, correspondence. Then I go look in the correspondence and see what did I actually do for this client this month except hammering on the other attorney's head about some rights or some, something that my client wants. And it pains me to see that you have to pay 3,000 rand to a lawyer just to write 20 letters to another lawyer for something that your client is entitled to, but you're not getting the client the, the court order the, the, because the court order is the solution. That is what you're paying me for, for the solution, not for threats to the other lawyer. And I always tell my clients, when you instruct me, okay, remember that instruction needs to be informed. So I'm going to tell you the bad of it and I'm going to tell you the good of it. If you give me instructions, you're going to know both angles, and I'm going to assume that your instruction to me is informed. So if I tell you there's no point in telling the other lawyer for the 10th time to give you access, because it's going to cost you just more money, if we tell that lawyer we're going to get a court order to force them to give you access, we have to do that. We have to follow up. We, we cannot threaten something in, in correspondence and then don't follow through because that's where legal fees increase because we're going to bicker about that one letter now. There's no solution. It's only costing you money. So when I make a promise in a letter and I say I'm going to take legal action against you if you don't respond by close of business, I am not going to send a letter tomorrow referring to my letter from yesterday. I know that we have received no response. Um, kindly note that if we don't get a response to this letter about that letter about a close of business, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do what I promised that lawyer in that letter. I'm going to approach court on an urgent basis and I'm going to go get an interdict or I'm going to go get an order forcing the person to do what I need them to do. So I think people need to understand that although divorce is very emotional, it's a pain, it's a, it's a pain experience, it's a terrible experience. There are different professionals for different issues that you may experience simultaneously during divorce. There's child psychologists that needs to, to, to be involved, meaning you cannot ask your lawyer to speak to your child about a problem that occurred between the other party and your child, because I simply am not qualified to be speaking to a minor child. There's a child psychologist 
who has been trained to speak to a minor child and to capture the child's voice. I cannot climb into the, because I, 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 number one, I'm not qualified. Number two, I have not been appointed to be acting as the child psychologist. Number two, if you are experiencing emotional distress, um, 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 obviously sometimes along with it financial distress, I can help you with a financial distress, uh, uh, distress by applying for a Rule 58 in the Magistrate's Court or a Rule 43 in the High Court. I can help you with that. But the emotional distress, obviously I feel, but I cannot assist you with that because I am not trained. I'm not trained. I'm not academically trained to assist you with the emotional side. There is trained professionals to deal with that kind of, uh, with that, that, that all I can do is bring you the financial relief for interim maintenance or for interim care. So I think people, people just need to understand, again, what the purpose of a lawyer is. A lawyer is not there to, 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 to throw mud with you because there's lots of anger in, in divorce. If, if there's no much, there should be no much slinging between attorneys. We, are, we must do our job. And our job is to enforce our clients' rights. And we have an ethical code that we need to remain within how we get our client solutions. So do not expect your, your, your lawyer to be sending salty letters to the other party. One or two lines, if my client does not get access by 6 o'clock, I'm approaching the court for a for, for, um, uh, on an urgent basis, and the legal cost is going to be uh, for your account. If they don't do it by five o'clock tomorrow morning, I'm going to contact you. I've got no response from the other lawyer. Do you want me to proceed with approaching the court? Yes. There we go. We're going to get the interdict. And that is keeping your legal fees low, and you're actually paying for a solution. Nezri, thank you very much for that. That was very inspiring, and I agree with you 100%. Um, clients are paying legal fees for legal results and legal services. They're not paying legal fees for you to actually mess up their case and to, to fight their battles for them. Then you're just becoming just as the Pacific parents are. You know, they're using the minor child as a pawn. What you are do now doing is you are using, they are using now you as a pawn to fight their Pacific battles and nobody wins. Nasli, on, on the same point, if, if, I, if I may, um, many people, they think that, you know, a lawyer is a hired gun. You're not a hired gun. You have an ethical obligation towards the courts, towards the law, and so on, and you have to do your duty and you have to do your job. And I do not, if somebody comes to me and saying, Mr. Abderov, here's money, um, do what, do this, you know, make the person life miserable. I said, sir, that's not what I do. Um, there's many other people that want to make use of my services or can make better use of my services than me just, you know, jumping for what you have to say and what you want me to do. I think we fix the sound now. Oh, Felicity and Guess is online here. She's also saying hi to both of us. That's also nice of her. So, Nazli, one final question to you. How do people, your details are online um, on the video. Um, can people contact you, email you? What What do they do? What What's your approach? What, you know, how do you connect with you? Well, they can contact me via um, um, my WhatsApp business line. I usually just respond quickly over WhatsApp. And then they can obviously call me. Um, I'm not always able to answer the phone because that's, uh, it is also the business line. So sometimes I'm doing Zoom consultations like um, uh, or Zoom meetings like with you now. But they can send me an email because I always respond to emails. So you might not get a quick reply on WhatsApp or on the telephone, but my email is always open. I check emails throughout the day. Um, they can contact me via that. Um, sorry, Advocate, I just need to go quickly back to something. When you were talking about a hired gun, do you mind if I just speak about that quickly? So go ahead. Okay. If a lawyer ever tells you that they are a bulldog attorney, or if a lawyer ever tells you that they are the, the gunpowder, okay? According to me, or in my personal opinion, there, is, there should be no such thing as a bulldog in family law matters. The only people that are going to lose is the children, if there is minor children, or it's going to be you and you're going to feel it in your pocket. Okay? A family law attorney should be helping to guide these parties to wrap up their divorce at the least expense to them, financially, emotionally, and psychologically. What does that mean? It means that you must not only look 
at the most cost-effective way to get these people to divorce, but you must make sure that whatever action you take on behalf of theirs is at the least expense to them emotionally and psychologically. Meaning, if you do not have to fight, then don't fight. I can still fight for you without flinging mud and writing 20 letters. Me advocating for you and me fighting for you is me making sure that the other attorney knows I cannot allow my client to sign this agreement because there and there are loopholes that might bring my client back to me in a couple of years to apply either for a variation, which must be done as soon as you actually notice that something is wrong, but to uh, apply for an increase or to apply for something that you haven't noticed before, you want to prevent all of that. These things are what is what affect people emotionally and psychologically. So please do not fall for the bulldog bulldog uh, uh, um, kind of. If somebody says, oh, go to that lawyer, that's a bulldog lawyer. A bulldog lawyer can also mean the person is a good attorney in the sense that they um, have a good relationship with court officials. They've got a good relationship with, with, with other attorneys. It could also mean that. But we all know most of the time it means that someone appoints a bulldog or a hired gun to get you the most or to tax the other person or make the other person void of resources, almost like uh, um, leaving the other person with nothing. But what you don't understand or realize sometimes is that there's, there's a law, there, there is a matrimonial property act that says if there's a pension fund and you're married in community of property, you're entitled to 50. No hired gun and no bulldog attorney can make that 50% go away that you're entitled to unless they are granted a first forfeiture order by the court. And to get a forfeiture order, there's requirements. And no court is going to grant a forfeiture if you or your attorney cannot prove that it would be in your, uh, 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 that it would be just and that it would be equitable. Okay? A court is not willy-nilly going to set aside a marriage and community of property just because there's a bulldog on the other side. All attorneys follow the same law. We follow the same law book. We follow the same ethical code. Okay? So, bulldog or hired gun, most of the time, in my experience, is, would be costing more money because it's fighting without solutions. You cannot make the act go away. You cannot make the law go away. You can only work within that framework unless you're going to be like the advocate here who develops the law every so often. <laughs> so, um, so that that is just my my info, uh, like my view on it. No, Nazi. Nazi, thank thank you very much for that, and I appreciate that, and it's an honest answer because you, you're 100 percent right. And sometimes when the when the lawyer or the advocate or attorney act as a bulldog, it means they don't know the job. So they, they use aggression to get the results, and you know where I where I you know I got this one tactic. Um, I always play you know it hu humble etc. So that the other party can speak nicely to me, I can engage with him, and I can obtain information from the other party. And in the back of my brain, I know you know we can't settle this matter. We go to the court, and I'm very good in court, and I can I'll win this matter in court. I won't necessarily win it. We you know outside the courtrooms arguing and fighting with each other. That won't work. And there's this one one last point um, which you mentioned early on regarding this a thousand correspondence up and down. I firmly believe that you are writing your own court record in the sense of if you're going to send a thousand emails and a thousand letters, the other party can go to the judge and and, pre, and attach all the documentation to court direct to the to the application to court or as um, you know discovery or you know witness bundled and so on and. The end of the day, the court will look through this documentation and they, it will be presented to the judge or to the magistrate that these people were, were only out here for the money, they were only out here for a mission, whatever the case may be. So it's very important that your legal team, whatever document you present to the other side, it technically becomes public for, for the parties, if for lack of a better way of saying it. And um, you need to limit that. Nasri, we, oh, we're on an hour now. It's now seven minutes past five. We started just about 10 past. Nasri, any final words on your side before we wrap up? Yes. Actually, I wanted to talk about that that you just mentioned now. Um, many people think because if a letter says without prejudice, it means the judge will never see it. What they don't realize is that that without prejudice part relates to the settlement negotiation itself. 
So whatever you say in between there that is costing the parties unnecessary litigation fees and unnecessary nonsense, the judge sees, will see that. Okay, the judge will see that. He might not take note of the settlement negotiations in the letter itself for the purposes of finding, of his finding in the case itself, because it's without prejudice. But when, you order, when you're going to uh, um, argue costs at the end, these in-between bickering and in-between uh, uh, dragging out of cases, all of these things can be raised by the other party. Where the other party can say, listen, this party needs to pay my, my client's legal fees because this, if this uh, lawyer did not send all these insults over the past eight months, this matter would have been resolved six, seven months ago. Now we have to go to trial. We have to uh, um, get an expert witness for 220,000 rand. So for that, the, 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 the reason why we are here and why it's costing my client 500,000 rand for this matter is because this, this, this lawyer has been hopping on and being insulting for the past eight months, okay? So those letters are gonna be presented for the purposes of, 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 of cost. So even if you see your lawyer writing strange things there and being insulting to the other party, just know that the judge is gonna see these things, especially when it's coming to a cost hearing where they need to determine who's gonna pay whose cost because usually the cost follow the results. So if you are not going to be successful, or um, obviously that is not, um, it doesn't always happen like that, but just remember, you are going to be out liable for whatever it is your attorney said that did not further your matter and that uh, um, extended the case. And nowadays, there's also a cost order that is, or it's always been like that, but they're getting more serious about it because of the new uh, Rule 41A that came in on 9 March last year, where parties need to consider mediation. Remember, if your lawyer tells you, no, we're not going to mediate this, and they, and they don't discuss with you why they don't see the, the matter as, as a, a right for mediation, you must already know that there's a problem. Unless your attorney can explain to you why your matter cannot be mediated, and unless the other attorney has given an indication that they're going to continue being unreasonable, meaning it's going to be letters up and down again, then there is no reason why a matter cannot be referred to mediation. Nothing is so impossible. To, obviously, there's exceptions, but nothing is so impossible in the standard divorce matter that cannot be mediated. You're either married in community of property or you're not. Okay? You're either married with a crew or you're married completely out. When it comes to the kids, obviously it can take a bit longer. The family advocate is involved, all of that. So I understand that I prefer mediation for that even more so because there are children involved. You can spend the legal fees on your kids, okay? So when an attorney tells you off the bat, we're not going to mediate, we're going to take this straight to trial, make a point of asking your attorney to sit down with you and explain to you why this cannot be mediated because if the result, if the, the cost follow the result, it means that if you lose your matter and it comes to the cost hearing, the judge is going to ask you, why did you not want to mediate? What was so unmediatable? And if you don't have a satisfactory answer, if you don't put it in that rule, 20, uh, sorry, that form 27, they're going to make a cost order against you and sometimes even against the attorney. That's, that's what I wanted to say about, about that. Nesbi, thank you very much for that. Um, I've got two points before I also wrap up. On the issue concerning the mediation, the Form 27 uh, and so on, yeah, there's only a few exceptions. One exception could for, uh, possibly be if it's an urgent application, life and death, you know, the child's being removed from the country and, you know, it's, it make, doesn't make sense to call for mediation under those circumstances. So, so that is one, one, one scenario. The other scenario could possibly be the parties have gone for mediation extensively. They've got a mediation certificate and the mediator says mediation failed. Obviously, it makes sense to go to court uh, under those circumstances. Yes, in those cases, yes, in those circumstances, obviously, then that's another story. That's why there's exceptions to it. But someone cannot tell you off, the, cannot tell you off the bed that that something is not mediatable without explaining to you uh, uh, why. I am an internationally accredited mediator. Um, I got my ADR ODR um, certification last year, so. Um, that's why I'm very passionate over mediation, especially in family law matters. But there are exceptions like the advocate just stated. But in most cases, really, you need to be explained why 
why mediation is not an option because you're going to be held liable for the other party's view, and this is the high court now. Um, I think um, in the magistrate court, it's court a next mediation that might be play a role when it comes to cost. Um, I don't litigate a lot in the magistrate court, um, but in the high court, ask your attorney about the mediation uh, um, uh, rule, rule 41A. Uh, make sure you see that form 27 in case um, uh, um, your attorney advises against mediation so that you can see the reasons why it's being um, uh, um, declined because cost is a thing and high court litigation is very expensive. So make sure you are behind the fear of your own legal matter. Leslie, thank you for that. Leslie, one last point on my side regarding the without prejudice, just for explanation. If you see some letter telling the person, we're willing to give you 10,000 rand in full and final settlement without prejudice, that sentence is not regarded by the court because that is not negotiations and the court does not see that as any admission and taking responsibility for the case is a without prejudice um, offer. But at the, same, at the end of the sentence you say, if you don't accept this, we will litigate against you till the end and it will cost you a million, hundred million thousand rand in legal fees and we'll make sure that you have nothing at the end of the day. That paragraph is with prejudice. It doesn't fall with, without prejudice. The only part without prejudice would be the aspect concerning the money. The negotiation. Yes. So that is what a lot of lawyers actually don't, don't, don't understand. The whole letter in itself is not without prejudice. Only the terms or the proposal as or the offers as it relates to the actual offer. Meaning, listen, give me say, I know you owe me fifteen thousand rand, but give me ten thousand rand, we call it we call it a day. It doesn't mean that the person admits that you only owe them ten thousand instead of the fifteen. So that is without prejudice, meaning they cannot turn around and go and tell the judge, listen, you see here, she was willing to accept ten thousand rand. It means that she knows she I don't owe a fifteen, just ten. That is the without prejudice part. Not the part where you say, um, you know, if you don't accept this, I'm going to do this and this and this and this. And remember, um, the other day when I told you this and this and this and this, those are not without prejudice. Only the settlement negotiations, the offers and the proposals. The terms in the letter that is trying to resolve the matter because the court does not want to or you should not feel um, uh, um, discouraged to try and resolve the matter. That is the purpose, actually. Um, it might just be my opinion, but that is the reason why you can negotiate without prejudice. Even in mediation, is so that you can feel free to, wo to work towards a, re a resolution of the matter. Because if you know that can be held against you, then obviously why must I settle oh, just in case? Just in case you take this, you don't accept my offer, then you're going to go tell the judge I'm only going to accept 10,000 and because I only owe you uh, 10,000 or you owe me 10,000. So um, that is just to encourage parties to freely negotiate to try and get a resolution or to uh, uh, resolve the matter. But remember, there's other things in between that does not work towards resolving the matter or does not further the matter and those things are not without prejudice. Nazi, thank you very much for your time. And this was the longest webinar I've done with another lawyer for a long time. Thank you very much. And I hope we can have one again next week. There's a lot of pertinent uh, issues involved here, and you've got a very passionate way of answering it. It's like you hammer the answer into the person, as opposed to somebody just in a nonchalant and a very monotonous way, you know, advising people. We're here to educate and teach people, and on family matters, it's even more important that we hammer it down. Because if you can save one family and one child, you've done a great deal. Nazi, any final words on your side before we wrap up? I just want to say to everybody, it's a difficult time that we are living in. Um, it, it, it's really, it's, it's emotionally trying on everyone. I want you to, to know that the courts are there. If you don't have a maintenance order in place, approach the court, don't give up. Don't, don't be uh, discouraged by the time you have to wait. Don't be discouraged by other people saying, yeah, but I, I never got the order or I never... Your legal matter is unique to you. You go and apply. You, 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 for, you drive your matter. No lawyer can drive your matter on your behalf if you are not going to, to, to push it, okay? Try to do everything, the legwork yourself. You do not need to pay a lawyer to go and sit three hours in a line at court, okay? Try to do most of the legwork yourself. Complete your own application form. Get your own receipts together. Paste your own receipts 
on 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 um on paper make your own copies to for me to make copies of your application that's not legal work that's not law work okay you do not need to pay me 3000 rand so i can make copies you do not need to pay me to go and sit in a line when you come to your lawyer to help you with your legal matter the only thing you need from your lawyer is number one legal advice and to help you and to guide you in drafting your documents to make sure the court understands what you want. The administrative work like filing, copies, service, things like that, I think you can do yourself. You do not need to go and take out a second bond on your home, okay? Don't be afraid to ask questions when you are at maintenance court. A maintenance officer is not a magistrate. A maintenance officer cannot tell you that you cannot get a certain amount because, um, because the other party is earning this or this or this. They can guide you towards that. If you are not convinced of what the other party has brought to this maintenance officer, ask for your matter to be set down for trial so that a full financial inquiry can be made into the other person's finances. Stop stopping at the maintenance officer and then turning around and saying the maintenance court did not help me. It's not the maintenance court that didn't help you. It is the maintenance officer that told you something and you accepted it as an order. It's not an order, it's, a, it's advice. The maintenance officer is there to see if they can have you guys settle the matter and, um, and, and, and make a maintenance order by consent. That is what they are there for. If you are not convinced of the documentation or proof that the other party brought and you tell that to the maintenance officer, that maintenance officer has a duty to set your matter down for trial because you are not convinced and you want a full financial inquiry. You are entitled to that. So do not stop at the maintenance officer. If you are not getting the respect that you deserve at the maintenance court, there's a court manager, go and, con go and file a complaint, follow up on your complaint. Stand your ground because remember the maintenance court is a is a is a is a, is a judicial place. It's a judicial wing. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of applications lodged every month. The Cape Town Magistrates Court is understaffed at the moment. I think it's still only one maintenance officer at the moment. So and plus it's covered. Plus plus it's covered closures. So obviously there's more pressure on the maintenance court now to get through these applications, okay? So what I'm saying is, is that do your legwork, go and follow up, call them, keep them on your matter, just for, just for now, now that everybody's trying to get through the applications with only one maintenance officer over there. Um, don't sit back and wait for, for any feedback because you're not going to get any feedback. They are simply too much on top of the maintenance court right now. I want people just to understand that the court is so understaffed and I think sometimes under-resourced as well, but it's not going to bring you a resolution to wait and sit till it gets fixed. You need to be proactive. You need to make sure that, 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 that you get the resolution for yourself because I, what I can do is I can sit and say the court is understaffed or um, I didn't get a response. So you can either wait for your response five months or you can go to court and get your response it shouldn't be your job you should be updated you should get your case number you should get your court date but the reality is at the moment nobody's getting it so you need for now you need to be proactive we need to find a resolution for you and only you can drive it that is my advice Nazi, thank you very much for your time um Nancy teachers are online um Nancy williams um, Patton Williams attorneys and an email address and a telephone number. Um, it's, it was an impassionate uh, webinar. I never had one of these for a long time. Thank you very much. And Nazli, I hope to see you online soon. Um, Nazli, stay online quickly while I'm um, ending the webinar quickly on Facebook, etc. But just stay on online. I'll chat you soon. Have a lovely day, everybody. And remember, tomorrow I'm online at 9 a.m. I'm doing this a webinar on family law. So if you want to watch anything, be online tomorrow at 9 a.m. Have a lovely day.